Sorry. My, my point of view is that you're right, um, the suburban model is not going to collapse. It will probably be powered by nuclear-powered electric cars before we know it, um, and it will probably get even worse. That's my hunch. But at the same time, you can't say that, you know, a percentage of us, and we might only be a third of the population, can't have the other. That's my view. There are many cities throughout the United States where there are suburbs and the people leave their cars in their suburbs and they come into the city center by light rail, by other forms of transit and by bus, and they're using the rental bicycle when they're in the city. I know in China, it's more prestigious to drive a car, but now they have put limits on your cars and you can only drive based on your license plate certain days of the week. Very wealthy Chinese people buy two cars, so they have two license plates, or they drive on a different route. But the beauty is the social stigma is no longer there. You don't know if a bicyclist owns a car and they just happen to have their license plate day, or if they don't own a car and they happen to ride on a bicycle. I think we're going to see, even with the suburbs, that people are going to drop their kids off in the city center and the kids are going to go everywhere on a bike if they have a cycle system. I think you'll find that people will drive their car and they'll get on a rental bike or have another bike in the city center and they'll ride around because it's a pain in the neck to drive your car and park and drive in car and park. We've got a new model. And again, like the interstate highway system, we're making it up as we go and that's why I look to all of you to help shape this. You know, I, I, I've um, had the beauty of uh, being a, a little bit, well, the, the luck of being a bit older, and I can see uh, the, the historical love of the affair we've had of, uh, with the car in Australia. And you know, when you look back, uh, it, it was, we, right into the 50s and 60s, where cars have, were introduced, we've had um, this wonderful passion with them, which has been reflected in our, own, uh, our urban infrastructure and the way our cities and suburbs have been designed. So we've isolated ourselves and, and developed a, a, a whole lifestyle that's developed around cars. And th that's not going to change overnight, unfortunately. Um, but I think the, the growing um, concern and the, and the growing uh, push for bikes is going to come from that the health aspects. And, um, I know more, we're getting more and more people telling us that they want to ride bikes because of the health aspects and they're starting to see it as fun. And also I think because of the environmental aspects, people are starting to think about that. So um, it, it's not going to happen overnight, but it, it'll gradually happen. And the, the challenge is to get the infrastructure so that we can encourage that you know, 70 or 80 percent of people who want to cycle but feel scared and uh, don't feel safe on there at the moment. And that's why we look to people like uh, Nigel to retrofit what they can. Can I just add to that? It's not only the, the, with the, the love affair of the car, but what we've found in Launceston is that the, the how people, we, 
we didn't realize when we started putting in the cycle uh, network that we've got the, the, the arterial networks that what, how people uh, uh, connect to their roads. They just don't like things to change. Uh, and I think that's one of the things, that's the biggest uh, challenge we've got is bringing about change. And, and we're, we're, we're not so much cycle advocates, we're change managers and change, uh, uh, whether it's, uh, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get people to change the way they look at their roads and the, and the objects on them. the vehicular bicyclists, the John Forrester types, have insisted that they can teach women to bike in the road. Take my bike class, I will train you how to bike in the road. And then they have come forward and they've said, look, in California I had all these women sign up to take my bicycle class, they were so happy. Some of the women came forward and they told me that they really enjoyed biking in the road now because they'd taken the class. And I said, that's a subset of the population, they signed up for your class. And the women who were happiest came forward to you and said, I like now biking in the road. That's not the 99% of the population. Women, from an evolutionary standpoint, are risk averse because they create the progeny and the next generation will not live on if the women are not alive. It's just the way it is. Women in England die in higher proportions compared to the men because they are so obedient. Again, they're cautious, they're risk averse. They will wait obediently at the light for it to turn green for their turn to be able to go through the intersection. They proceed straight and they're killed by the, the left turning lorries. The guys, aggressors, hunters, will go forward at the red because they're getting out in front of the truck. They're beating the truck, they're beating the mobile source air pollution, they're getting through the red light as quickly as they can so that nobody hits them. They die in smaller numbers. We've recently had two crashes, two deaths. One was a woman from Ireland. She'd lived in Boston for a month. She was on her bike. She was stopped at the corner, just stopped at the corner, and the truck drove over her. Another was another instance of a woman stopped at the intersection waiting a truck just over over her because you know the backs of the trucks they sort of swing funny so we need to design for women children seniors parents with children on their bicycles we've always said they're the canaries in the mine but we also need to let them dress the way they want to dress to have the kids seats on the back to have all the groceries to not take away from the way the bike males want to bike but to give this opportunity to the women and not say Take my bicycle class and you'll be happy. I'll teach you how to bike in the road. I, I agree with that. I mean, Emma and I were just talking about this this morning about uh, the, the, the males are risk takers and they're, they're, they're on roads and as drivers they're risk takers uh, and on, on the bikes they're risk takers. and. Um, that's why there's more people out there. That I think from the Bike Futures Conference that was down here, they had those figures about uh, talking about the, the proportion of people who are bike riding, and that higher end starting off people are people like uh, like myself who are, who are willing who are used to taking risks. We like, we're used to sort of skiing down steep steep mountains or kayaking or doing other risky businesses, and so riding on the road is just another. Um, Risky business, so and you you get used to ass assessing those risks, whereas um, you know this I, I, I agree with the whole man about the protection of the protecting the species, and thank goodness they do. <laughs> Yeah. 
They have been pushing me back for 30 years. I went back to school late in life to get my PhD so I could tell them, no, you're wrong. They want to have the road width for themselves. They have written all the design documents that have said no cycle tracks. They have done this by a few men sitting around a table deciding what works for them. They have not based this on any research. In one early document, they said never build a cycle track because you walk over, people, pedestrians will walk over the cycle track to get to the pedestrian door, and then a bicyclist might hit them. Instead, build a bicycle lane in the door zone, never mentioning that the door zone is also very dangerous because every car has a driver, every car doesn't have a passenger. They want the wide width so they can take a lane and have a little bit of space. They don't want the width going into the cycle track. They don't want to be threatened and to be told by the car drivers you have to be over in the cycle track because they want to be in the road. They don't want their self-identity threatened. They want to be the singular bicyclist who is out there as the lone road warrior. And Finally, in the evolution of bikes, a long time ago, there just used to be a biker. You know, drop-down handlebars, maybe the kids' bikes, but those were toys. Then along came all the rest of us biking, and then the bikers said that they had to set themselves apart, so they designed the Fixie. And the Fixie was really cool because nobody else could ride the Fixie, and that left the hoi polloi was separate, and the Fixie riders were really cool. Well, then the Fixies became more popular, and everybody was riding a Fixie. So I was at a coffee shop in Cambridge, and I saw a girl come up, short black skirt, fishnet stockings, you know, with some holes in it. And she got off her Fixie, but she would not take her leg and lift it over the saddle, because that's what everybody else did. She took her leg and lifted it over the handlebars, so she could look different from everyone else. So they've continued to figure out how do they keep this model of the Lone Road Warrior, and by taking big populations and making them bicyclists, we're taking away their self-identity. We've told them, you can continue to bike in the road, you can bike on anything you want, we will fight against side path laws that say you have to always bike in the cycle track. But don't you have a mother? Don't you have a daughter? Don't you have a wife? Please let us have these facilities. Okay, um, yeah, I've been anticipating that sort of question. Um, can I say that, um, that, that what I say here is uh, not necessarily the views of Longton City Council, so they're my views, so just, so just so that you don't feel I'm here preaching what the City Council <laughs> um, thinks. Um, um, I, 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 I mean, what, the, one thing I was going to say is that um, um, planning urban environments and particularly planning road environments and how you take care to it for traffic is, is, is about sort of two main things, really. First, firstly is environment and the second one is is is, is culture um, and and the first one is is the environment and we do look at all these wonderful examples around the world of what's been done and you look at how they use road space and and and, and, and the first comment you have is there's just not room for that in one system <laughs> and and um, and in some cases that is the case you know it's how you, how you manage all that road space to make the best use of it and um, when we start to take out space for a particular type of user, like a cyclist, and there's not many of them around, we often get that criticism that you know there's only one or two bikes an hour on that bit of road, so why do you dedicate that much space to cyclists? But obviously, as we know, 
Unless you do, there will be lots of cyclists who don't want to use those roads. But the second one is culture, um, and I guess this applies in particular to the European examples of what we see and what maybe we want to try and emulate. Um, um, in, in European um, countries, um, one of the things which they have in place, which is quite significant, I think, is, is um, presumed liability. And what that means is that um, if a motorist hits a cyclist or a pedestrian, they're presumed to be at fault under in insurance unless they can prove otherwise. And I think that has a significant impact on the way that um, motorists behave around, among, around cyclists and pedestrians, and I think it influences the behaviour. I mean, the other thing I think which is significant is that a lot of these places seem to have taken those bold decisions too take out parking, take out road capacity to provide for alternative forms of transport. And maybe that will be the line that we take and that's the way that we, want, we, we want to go. But at the moment, that is a real struggle, I assure you, certainly in places like Launceston. I'm not sure that totally answers your question about how to do it, but it, I think maybe highlights some of the struggles that we have in trying to do what we'd like to do. That, that reflects voting, though, doesn't it? Because, you know, you, you can't speak on behalf of Launceston City Council because they're elected to speak on behalf of voters who want road capacity for cars and they want parking. They don't want bicycle paths. And um, this is the impasse that I see in a place like Launceston, that we can, we know what needs to be done, you know, um, we can refer to the Dutch as to what needs to be done, but it won't be done because we live in a democracy. So that's where I think, where, where is the road through? Where's the, where's the detour that we might need to take to come back to this? Can I say, I, I think uh, Gonsonson's at the stage now where we, we do really meet, need to make a decision about where we go with, with um, bikes in, in Launceston. We've, we've got, we're starting to build up demand um, for, for infrastructure. We're seeing it on our off-road trails and we're, that's, they're getting more and more use. Uh, we're seeing gradually more and more commuters coming into town. But uh, it's still relatively too, too cheap to use your car in Launceston and, to, and it's still too easy to park your car in Launceston if you want to positively do, um, discriminate against cars. I mean, I, I know I can still drive my car into town and park virtually where I need to to, um, to, to get where I want. And, and, but I guess, as, as Solomon McKenrick would to testify, if we wanted to put up the parking fees in, in Launceston to double them, um, you know, they'd be, uh, they'd be marching in the street. It'd be, but that's the sort of steps we need to do to actually get cars you know, off the street and make room for, um, for bikes. And, uh, and, but somebody's got to make that, take the leadership with that. And, uh, and, it's, and it's, it's, to me, it's in the local authority, the way that has to come from. I think if you look at problem solvers associated with conflict resolution, you know that the best solution, both sides feel they have a win. So I think it's very important to not view the car drivers as evil, to not view the, view the bicyclist as evil, the pedestrians as evil. And I characterize this way to do things as red pajama, blue pajama. When you put your children to bed, you don't say, do you want to go to bed, yes or no, because they're going to say no. If you instead say, do you want to put on the red pajamas or the blue pajamas, they'll pick a pair of pajamas. They're both yes lovers. So for the conflict resolution, then give everyone only yes lovers associated with the bike. They can range in a variety of ways. Should we have this little pilot cycle track on this one location that Stephen had suggested? Should we take some of our streets and make them two-way that were one way? Should we look at creating outdoor, you know, the bicycle parking outside, the, the car parking outside the city? Should we take away some parking on one side and put the cycle track in and not have the cycle track on the other side? Should we narrow the street, still allowing two lanes of traffic in the middle as they have done in Sydney, still both lanes of parallel parking, and the cycle track? Because the cycle track essentially is the same width and even less compared to the painted bike lane with a buffer and the painted bike lane with the, the other buffer. So you're giving the citizens a whole range of red pajama, blue pajama, purple pajama, yellow pajama. They're all yes levers for the bike. 
and let them help pick which one they would like to try first. Even though people don't like change, they're willing to do a pilot if you ask them and you say, which pilot would you like? Could we do a test? If you don't like it, we'll take it out. Because too much change is too hard to implement and you really want to bring the citizens along and have them like the bicyclists, have them like the children, have them like the seniors. And then again, it's really critical to put a cycle track in and have a lot of users using it. Because then you'll say, okay, that pilot worked. I see all those users, those people using that cycle track, they will be the ones to also say, oh, could we have more of these? At some point, it would be nice to work with the city and say, okay, if we did a second pilot, or even if we connected this pilot, more yes levers, how would we change the streets? We're not changing them. We're going very incrementally. We're asking your permission for your feedback every step of the way. But where should we put a cycle track in next? And where next? And where's a bicycle piazza? So you can go there, get your coffee, meet everybody. Where's a hub for that? Do you want your kids to bike to school? Again, this is ruthless. Everybody loves kids. Nobody wants to hurt kids. So if you know, and we can give you all the statistics about obesity control in children, then, oh, if you want your kids to bike to school, what if you created a cycle track to the school? Yes, lovers. That was, that was that probably a bike lane? You think it was a paint? Is it painted? Yeah, bike lane. It's painted bike lane. Yep. 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 And it's a very broad road, and so they try to narrow down the speed of that road by putting buses in the middle as well. But um, they sent around surveys, and people like me said, yes, we want all these things. But apparently, a lot of people who didn't fill in the survey then later on injected, and it was a lot of drugs. There are a number of schools, high schools, along that road. Um, to me, it would be ideal to focus on the, on the high school people riding. But why is there not more public discourse about it, and why isn't it being, um, you know, spoken about in the newspaper, and, you know, you could sort of have um, a bike stand in the middle of the mall where you have, you know, hand out booklets and ask questions. To me, I think that needs to be more public education, because a lot of it are motorists. I would suggest that you look to your newspapers and every single week you have information about all the different types of bicycle facilities. Because once you have an informed population, then they're going to be better able to make decisions. You were given a bike lane or no bike lane. Two choices, yes or no. And I know Jennifer Dill in Portland had done research in which she gave GPSs to people who were bicyclists, males and females, equal in number. And then the article said, everyone loves a bike lane in the door zone. That's because it was a revealed preference survey. It was only based on the environments in Portland, and the only thing they had were bike lanes in door zones. They couldn't also bike on a cycle track because they didn't have a cycle track. If you do a stated preference survey and you show people a variety of pictures, and they then get to pick, and they say, I want this one and not this one, I know they're going to like the cycle track because every survey anybody has ever done, and there are plenty of them, it's a stated preference survey, and you show pictures of all the bicycle environments. Everybody says, I want that one. I want the cycle track. And one woman even said, oh, I like that two-way cycle track because if I go up and I get lost, I know how to get back home. I mean, the sort of dropping crumbs on your way, just lovely. So give people the options, but I think you could just start by staggering numbers of newspaper articles, inform everybody. And then, when the decisions are being made about do you want this or this or this, give the citizens the option so there really is discourse instead of a bike lane. Thank you. I just, I just one word on, on that uh, funding.
And at the moment, we're, we're relying on a volunteer group to do that sort of thing. I mean, we've got, um, we've put out a code of conduct for cyclists, which I've got some here if you, you know, which is trying to get cyclists to um, to behave to a, a standard of behaviour. Uh, not only it sets out the rules and it sets out a, a standard of um, social behaviour that they should, you know, they should be looking towards. It doesn't cost a lot of money to build a cycle track. You can do so by moving over the parallel parked cars and painting a lane. If you want, stick up a couple of delineator posts to remind the cars don't pull over by the curb. It would be best if you do have some intersection treatment for any cars turning in or turning out if there is a cross street, but you're a whole lot safer in a cycle track compared to a bike lane. You can for free get people to write newspaper articles. Have it on a rotating basis. Uh, send people to the web. There is so much information that's free out there. You can have people doing blogs, getting the information out there. You don't have to print everything in a brochure. That costs money. And then how long does it live? Just get the general information out there. In Stowe, where I started creating the Stowe Recreation Path, and nobody had ever done that in a small town, then I would go to the grocery store and I'd be buying food and people would come up and say, oh, could you, can you do this next? How about doing this project? Or oh, did you think about this? So their comments would go in the article because I was constantly being fed more information by the citizens. So if you can find a couple of writers who are writing about bicycle, they'll get the content and they will be asking the questions. And I never wrote a single newspaper article, just as I gave the talk here, and said, I have all the answers. Instead, I would give you the information, you give the information back to me, I give it back to you. It's a full iterative process. And then, collectively, you arrive at the final decisions and the final designs. And I wanted to mention the mayor of Erlang in Germany was a Fulbright scholar. He came to the U.S. and he studied Lewis uh, Mumford and Jane Jacobs, went back and said, no highways, we're only having the bus and the bike. What happened in the 70s then, 
all the people in the U.S. went to a little bitty Erlang in Germany that was a university town and a hospital town to see how he took a very historic town and he put the bike everywhere. He would have a two-lane road. Okay, one lane is allowed to be for cars. The other lane is for bikes. Okay, one sidewalk's allowed to be for bikes. Okay, the other sidewalk is for pedestrians. Okay, the bikes are able to go through the parks. Okay, the bikes are able to go on a cycle track. He devised every way possible to incorporate the bike. So instead of just saying, well, we're going to do everything the way everybody else has done, be way out in front. You've got the architecture school. Try to be really, really innovative. Get newspaper articles written about Tasmania. I think it's a fascinating area. Getting, getting off the airplane and seeing sheep? That doesn't happen everywhere. <laughs> so build it up, do things that are innovative, really test it out, put in the pilots, ask the citizens, engage the citizens. Everybody's great here. They'll say if they like it or don't like it. Give them all the options. Put yourself on the map and put yourself on the map with a bike. I hope so. We're hoping that we're hoping it's been shipped from Melbourne, um, and we're hoping it's arrived now. They're there.